It is so it is not a literal cloud. And and I do let's see, I guess what they do is they like pin me something. We're recording. Hello, hi. <laughs> recording people. Um so uh let's see. I don't know how to do that. So yeah, so that means you guys are all like being shown to the public. So if you don't want your face to be seen in the future by people watching this video, you should uh, take yourself off video. Um, are these recordings available? That's a good question. They're available if I put in the time to put them on my YouTube channel. And right now I am going through an existential YouTube crisis, which was uh, triggered by someone saying that they watched one of my videos and an advertisement came on during during the guided meditation. And uh, so I don't want it. <laughs> I don't want that to happen. So I, we are trying to, along with some of my helpers, trying to figure out how to make uh, YouTube not do that. But uh, we have not yet been able to figure that out. So um, so right now the recordings that do exist, and there are many, many of them, are on my YouTube channel. And as I say, I cannot guarantee that your meditation will not be interrupted by an advertisement for Ozempic or something of the sort. So let me just find my, um, if I can, <laughs> my YouTube channel, uh, which is always tricky because it's under a different... Uh, Google account, huh? You know, you love this. And I'm recording all this. So hi, hi people on the recording. Sorry. Well, anyway, I'm not going to do that right now. I can't find it easily enough. Um, so I will just say that there is a Kevin Griffin YouTube channel and you can find it, I'm sure, because you are all competent internet people who have found their way to Zoom uh, oh, that's M N oh, Minis oh, Minneapolis AA. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, and and you know, I would think that at least they would pay me <laughs> if they're going to run ads on my channel. I mean, you know, not that I I would I would not uh, you know, you go out to to make money that way. But I mean, if they're going to use me and abuse me, at least pay me. But anyway, let's move on and let go of our resentments uh, while we meditate. So, um, uh, oh, go to participants window, click on yourself and pin. Okay, thank you. So who is this person who's posting? I don't know your name. So Achala Pat? It's Achala Pat. You Hi. do know me, but. Oh, I do? Okay. And I can also check with um, IMCW. Um, to find out because their YouTubes are not interrupted. Yeah. And then uh, I'll check on my cookies. Right now I'm muting. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for your help. All right. And someone put my YouTube channel in there too. So there are other Kevin Griffins in the world, quite a, quite a few of them actually. So uh, you want to make sure it's the real this one, there is the lead guitar player for Better Than Ezra, as I like to point out. But uh, in any case, uh, let us um, sit and be done with all this noise. Ah. So just settling back. Let's take some deeper breaths if that feels comfortable. Maybe we can call them cleansing breaths. And finding your posture.
Letting the body settle. Using the breath to calm the body. And so we can connect with the breath at a particular point, like the nostrils or the belly, just the touch or movement. Or we can feel the breath in a more open way, just feeling the whole body and the breath moving in the body. Our active and busy minds sometimes resist focusing on the simplicity of breath, letting that be the whole of our experience, the whole of our awareness. Or you might even feel the, the pull the pull of the mind for distraction, entertainment, for movement. And we can just breathe with that pull. Let that be held in the space of awareness with the breath. Thoughts come and go, sensations appear, feelings, emotions capture us. If we can stay in touch with the breath, as a you know, tether to the earth, to the present moment. And these things don't have to take us away. They are more seen as objects showing up in consciousness.
on this early stage of a period of meditation. And a key task is just cultivating enough tranquility to be comfortable. From that place of comfort, then being able to observe, observe the mind, observe the body. But even Developing this much calm can be challenging. It doesn't necessarily come and so we have to learn to work with and be with the unpleasant, unpleasant mind states or energetic states. And we try to bring an attitude of kindness, of acceptance, of patience, of persistence. Just staying with the process, trusting the process. non-judging so that whatever arises is acceptable, is okay. Don't make a problem out of any aspect of our experience, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant.
Um, all other little announcements before uh, get into this talk is um, this Thursday, which will be April 4th, I'll be starting a four week class series at San Francisco Dharma Collective. And um, that is going to be a uh, hybrid. So uh, 7 to 8 30 p.m pacific time if you are interested join that and then this coming sunday morning i'll be on the buddhist recovery network's um academy so i'll give a talk 10 o'clock uh sunday morning um so nice to see people if you want to join any of those um Actually, it's a very busy month for me, a lot of teaching, but uh, it's all on my website. And a lot of it is, uh, there's a, a bunch of live stuff um, or in-person stuff, and uh, but most of it is also um, hybrid. So uh, meanwhile, uh, as I mentioned, we've been going through this book, More Than Mindfulness, Widening the Field of Practice from the Abayagiri Monks, and it was uh, produced in celebration of Ajahn Pasano's 50th uh, anniversary of his ordination. So it must have been 1974 that he was ordained. And so uh, I think we're in like the fourth chapter. Uh, one, two, three, four, yes. Uh, from Ajahn Viradamo, and it's called Mindfulness, Vitality, and Inquiry. So this talk was given in Ottawa on January 23rd, 2008. Goes back a bit, but uh, timeless. Dharma is timeless. And it is um, Mindfulness, Vitality, and Inquiry uh, is essentially the first three of the seven factors of enlightenment or seven factors of awakening. Uh, and actually inquiry is the second one. So vitality or energy would be the third one. So I, I just um, have been, you know, going through each of these chapters for myself and making notes. And then, so I'll just um, kind of go through my notes and at some point I'll, I'll put all these notes up um, on, uh, we have kind of a, a Google Docs page, uh, and I can put these notes up there. Maybe when I'm finished with this series, uh, all the notes from the different, through the book. So uh, clearly the uh, first uh, factor of enlightenment is mindfulness. And, and uh, Ajahn Viridamo start, starts by just sort of talking generally about uh, Buddhist teachings and and uh, talking about how uh, they were, you know, each each teaching that we have in the in the canon, the Pali canon, was given at a particular time to certain people, and and so we can see that they're they can be very differently, as you say, pitched, uh, pitched to the audience or the person that he was talking to. And so certain uh, teachings are given to monastics. And so they have a, you know, a certain, he has a certain audience in mind there. Uh, and those tend to uh, certainly be more strict in terms of the morality elements and the lifestyle elements, you know, the ascetic practices. Um, and, and in fact, it's, there are certain collections, like the, the different collections, the, the Diga Nikaya, the longer discourses, were supposedly uh, given or pitched more towards people who weren't Buddhists and there, so there's kind of 
a lot of stuff in there that's talking about how wonderful and powerful and magical the Buddha was, or there's a bunch of mythical teachings in there, and, and, and they're kind of like promoting the whole thing. And, and then something like the uh, Anguttara, the, the numerical discourses, apparently they're thought of as a collection to, for the for teachers, particularly the monks, to use as as teachings, sort of like jumping off points for the their own talks. Um, uh, yeah, I don't, you know, so, some other things that I, I have some vague ideas about, but I don't want to get too vague. So just to just to understand that anytime we read a, or hear a, a Buddhist teaching from these early scriptures that. Uh, you know, it's it's for a particular time and place. And so if we hear things that seem somewhat contradictory or co coming from very different approaches, it's uh, partly because of this. And then, of course, part of it is just because the, the oral tradition that was written down uh, winds up, you know, not being a exact or necessarily totally reliable uh, transcription of what the Buddha said. Uh, and things got changed over time. Um, then he, he says, uh, he's talking about his own practice and how he's sort of more interested in the mental disciplines. And he says, Sometimes the teachings around the mind can sound selfish if taken out of context, which is something we hear from time to time from people um, that, um, and and this is was particularly a uh, a criticism that was leveled by the Mahayana tradition so another branch of buddhism sort of pointed at the at the theravada tradition as being uh, aimed at you know personal liberation and the mahayana then uh developed this idea of the the bodhisattva vow that is about liberating all beings so you shouldn't be trying to just get yourself enlightened and it, it, it's it can become a sort of theoretical, you know, <laughs> like when you become enlightened, you can decide whether you're, who you're doing it for. But, and and since the, the understanding in Theravada Buddhism is that enlightenment itself involves seeing through and becoming just detached from self-interest and you know, uh, detached from an, the idea of self and to see through the illusion of self so that so that even the idea that I'm getting practicing to get myself enlightened, that's you can't that doesn't even make sense in Buddhist terms. If there's no self to get enlightened. So uh, you know, calling it selfish is sort of missing the point. Uh, in any case, there you go. There's, there's a door you can go through to for a lot of exploration. Then he, he talks about different kind of monks and and this practitioners, and how uh, you know the Buddha would teach to different uh, people, individuals, and what what they were uh, really able to understand. So he, he compares how Sariputta was very analytical. And in fact, Sariputta is the one who delivers the uh, sutta on right view of the Samaditi Sutta. So it's a really vital sutta. And the Buddha, you know, praised it as being brilliant explication of right view. But then uh, here Viridamo compares that to, there was a monk who was not very analytical. <laughs> We get it that he's sort of like not too bright, but so the Buddha just told him to reflect on the purity of a white cloth. And then this monk like had his breakthrough into enlightenment, just sort of understood, oh, purity and, and versus impurity. 
uh, he goes on then, Viridamo uh, says, uh, don't get hung up on the lists, uh, which, you know, <laughs> a lot of people get, uh, I don't know if we get hung up on them, but a lot of people get confused by them or frustrated by them or bored by them or annoyed by them. Uh, that there's all these lists in Buddhism, Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, Seven Facts of Enlightenment, Five Hindrances, Five uh, Daily Reflections. Uh, um, I'm just trying to think of as many lists as I can. But, uh, uh, three characteristics, uh, and, and on and on. Uh, he says, they can be helpful because they give you reference points they give you structures within which you can observe how your own consciousness works. So yes, I think the best way to, to look at the lists is after you've done enough practice that they make sense to you. Like if you hear a list, like, like one list that I really struggled with for a long time was the five aggregates. And, and so I didn't spend, I mean, I would come back to it from time to time and read about it from different views. And, but then there was a certain point when it, it clicked and it, it wasn't that I figured it out. It was that my own practice evolved and my own understanding of Dharma evolved to the point was like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me now. So, so I think the best way to work with the lists is when you hear one that resonates, that makes sense to you, study that list, keep looking at it. You know, really, because, because you only need one list, <laughs> the Four Noble Truths. That's, that's the, uh, there's a term for it, but, but it's the great list. It's like the Maha list. You know, if you understand suffering and the cause of suffering, the end of suffering and the way to the end of suffering, then you understand everything you need to, to understand. Uh, but even, yeah, lists are not the point. It's the ideas, obviously, within the lists, understanding those things. Um, what I find helpful about the lists is once I, once I have a hold of them, it's easy to bring them up and, and to remember things. You know, because a lot of our Dharma practice is about remembering to be present, to how to look at things, remembering that everything is impermanent, remembering to be mindful, remembering to let go instead of being attached, remembering that anger is not helpful. So uh, when you remember that suffering is caused by clinging, it's a constant reminder to let go. So um, yeah, yeah, I use the lists, but don't don't get obsessed. Um, he talks about how people often become critical about the wandering mind. One begins to not like the practice. Uh, I think that's a really interesting observation, a good observation that. Uh, you know, when we first learn this practice, first of all, we get this idea that we're not supposed to be thinking, right? I mean, this is a very common uh, idea that, that gets in people's heads, usually when they're just first introduced to meditation. If you've been practicing for a while and hearing enough teachings, you you catch on that, okay, yeah, thinking is a natural thing. That's okay. But we can, even beyond that, you know, you can just get uncomfortable with, uh, you know, sitting with, with being with your own mind. I mean, it's not, it's not the greatest thing, uh, you know, to, to have a mind. I mean, we, it's, you know, it's humans take a lot of pride in their minds, but you know, if you if you pay attention to the experience of having a human mind, you realize, boy, it it maybe creates more problems than it solves. You know, 
uh, I mean, we can observe, uh, you know, it's kind of silly to like try to figure out what the mind of a bird is like or the mind of a cat, you know, but, but uh, they're certainly less complicated. And, and the task of meditation, in a sense, is to unravel all that complication and uh, you know, uh, uh, on this, uh, I'll say that's one way of looking at it. I, it's not probably not a great strategy, but but we're faced with it. We're faced with those complexities, and I'm sure every one of us here has had the experience of of not enjoying meditating because our mind wasn't in a pleasant state, you know, and and so as Viradamo points out that can then become, you know, counterproductive where we're, where we're like, oh, I, I don't want to meditate, you know, I'm going to have to be with my mind. You know? So I think, I, I, you know, this is certainly one of the things that I point to, and I think probably every Buddhist teacher points to is how to make friends with, or to, to come into some uh, tr make a truce with your own mind, you know, that I'm not going to um, fight with it. And, and so the, you know, the idea then is that what we start to see is that the, the real problem, and of course, this is the essence of the Four Noble Truths, that the real problem isn't what the mind is doing, it's how I'm reacting to what the mind is doing to my relationship to it. So if I can, you know, as Wes Nisker says, your mind has a mind of its own and you are not your fault, <laughs> you know, that we can say, okay, the mind is just doing its thing, but that's not me and I don't have to get caught up in it. I don't even have to be bothered by it. It's, you know, it's like when the neighbors are playing music too loud. Like, um, you know, I had an experience years ago. Um, I had moved into a new apartment, and it was on the second floor of this building. And and one night, this music started playing from downstairs pretty loud. And, you know, it's 10 o'clock, and, and it's 11 o'clock. And I'm like trying to go to sleep and it's midnight and it's still playing. So I go downstairs and I stand outside the apartment. The lights are off. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I even knocked on the door. It became apparent that there was nobody in the apartment and that they had left. Uh, an Aretha Franklin album playing. So at least it was good music, you know, but I, and as my recollection, it was actually the same song, just kept playing over and all night long, really loud. And uh, I was not able to get to a place of acceptance, I have to say. But it really, really was. I mean, I knew enough Dharma to at least know what I needed to do. I just wasn't able to get there, but but it was very much like, you know, your own mind when when you can't fall asleep, when your mind just gets stuck on something and starts playing something over and over, you know, if something very stressful or anxiety producing is is coming up, so this is, you know, kind of the the story of our practice is can I. Uh, can I just be with this and not not make it a problem? You know, kind of the fundamental challenge of the Dharma. So Viridamo then takes a little shift and says, you know, rather than focusing on that sort of negative aspect of the mind of like, oh, I don't like the wandering mind. He says, it's very important when we are awake to feel grateful and just to 
to notice that. You know, what one of the things you know we tend to universalize moments or you know impermanent things and and make them permanent in our mind. I'm always doing this. I'm always thinking about this. Or my mind is always like this, or I always feel like this. And that always is a is an inaccurate statement. And so if we can notice those moments when, oh, my mind actually is kind of quiet, or I feel relaxed right now. I'm not stressing. To really bring those out and, and bring awareness to those moments. He talks about how of being very diligent and hardworking in our meditation, but but being very critical. And instead to appreciate the moments uh, when we do wake up, recognizing that it's hard, so when it happens, to appreciate it. He says, when I am not aware, all kinds of ego states can come up. I become a resentful person. I start to think resentful thoughts, and that is a kind of birth. That is suffering. So that's kind of the dependent origination, right? That the self is born in the in the thought, in the resentful thought. That's the self being born. Um, and and this is something I've been reflecting on, and I think I might have mentioned. Uh, last week that, you know, the idea of selfing or, uh, you know, being aware when the self is arising, uh, I've, I've really found that to be quite an abstract idea that, that I couldn't really latch on to. But um, recently, I just sort of had this, uh, I don't, I can call it an insight, doesn't matter what we call it, but just this a different way of thinking about that that's not so, that isn't abstract and that that isn't so sort of like, oh, I'm having a not self moment, you know, some idea that it's some lofty experience of, exp of being aware of self or letting go of self, but rather, just and and actually, there's a classic sutta that I'll I'll talk about after I describe this. Rather seeing that when desire or aversion is arising, that self is arising. That that is self. That that's uh, no. It it isn't. That isn't self. But the self attaches to that, like, right? Because what that means is that I am angry, I am lonely, I am depressed, I am, you know, wanting something. So it's the I that attaches to the experience. So that when, because those are very strong experiences that I tend to identify with, that's self arising, which means that when I let go of them, I'm letting go of self. So I don't have to go like, where's the self? What, you know, because that's just a creation anyway. So just to, to make it simple, I'm just like, oh, okay. I just let go of that and just see that that's self and that's, that's self and that's not self, you know, that is, that is, the creation of self and it's and then when i let go of that whatever that you know desire or aversion these you know category categorizing those experiences when i let go of those things i'm letting go of self and the, and so that, i like that because it it gives me an a more accessible way to relate to that what is often a very abstract and you know high teaching that i that as i say i have a hard time sort of connecting with it 
I understand it conceptually and, you know, I've certainly reflected on not self and I can, you know, give you a Dharma talk about it, but in terms of actually like, oh, what, what's the direct experience of that? I think the direct experience of it is just when, when some strong idea, feeling, th thing arises in the mind, that that's self. And when I let go and I'm just present, I'm breathing, then I'm, I'm, there is no selfing happening. And selfing is a better term than this, for this than self, because it, it suggests that it's an activity, that self, self is an activity. It's a, it's not a thing. And that, you know, this is one of the, you've heard, you know, some wise teachers say that, that, that self is a verb, not, not a noun. And so that, that's really what I'm talking about is how selfing happens and then letting go of it, it's, it stopped happening. You don't have to create not self, right? Because not self is the natural state of things. You know? All you have to do is let go of self. It's just like the Four Noble Truths. There's suffering the cause of suffering, when you let go of the causes of suffering, there's no suffering. <laughs> you don't have to create not suffering, right? You just have to let go of the suffering. All right. Moving right along. A lot of notes here. I might not get through all of these today. Um, he says, if I am attentive, I can see a feeling of resentment, but I don't grab it. That is the freedom from the cycle of birth and death. So that is the freedom from the cycle of self and letting go of self, of selfing. That's the freedom from the cycle of selfing. Uh, and then he talks about mindfulness. He says, people sometimes think that mindfulness means you have to move very slowly, or they think it means controlling everything, or never feeling emotions like grief. Oh, just, yeah, that's not it. <laughs> you don't have to move slowly, and uh, you can't control anything, and uh, you're going to have feelings. About anger, he says, there's a huge difference between knowing anger and believing in anger, that difference is freedom. That's kind of a beautiful idea, right? You're either caught in the anger and believing in it, or you're just knowing, oh, there's anger there. And, and again, he's kind of saying, you know, it's okay to have these feelings. We're not meditating to get away, to not have feelings. We're meditating so that we're aware of the feelings and thus don't jump from the feelings into unwholesome or unskillful behaviors and, and carry them forward, create a self out of them. Uh, talks about how we avoid feeling difficult emotions. He says, we are so habituated to distracting ourselves away from childhood traumas, from pains or from loneliness. Part of unraveling our karma is slowly entering into areas that we find difficult. You know, that's a nice way of putting that, right? We and and when when you're meditating, and this is one of the things I point to a lot in, in my guidance, my discussion of meditation, when you're meditating, you find that the mind won't settle, that it's you know jumping around a lot it often means that you are avoiding actually feeling what's going on. And so he calls that, you know, we are so habituated to distracting ourselves. So when, when we start to feel things that are uncomfortable, then we start to think about things to distract us from the feelings. And, or, you know, to unravel that, as he puts it, is to breathe into slowly into areas that we find difficult. So what do they call this titrating, right? I don't know if 
everybody's heard that word, but I guess it's some kind of a psychologist word of like allowing in a little bit of the difficult feeling, breathing with it, but not, not sort of letting ourselves get overwhelmed by it. He says, there is a progression in the practice from grossness to more and more continuity and more and more subtlety. Hmm. So I was talking about this with uh, Tommy Rosen yesterday, the, the idea of, of becoming more and more subtly aware. It's actually what the talk on Sunday for the Birth Recovery Network is going to be about, about attunement. Um, and it, it, interesting here that he's talking about becoming more subtly aware, but also the continuity. So the continuity is what we typically would talk about concentration, being able to maintain your attention with the experience, with the breath and with the, with the under subtle experiences that are arising. So, uh, you know, I think this is, this is a, uh, something that kind of, we can bring back to recovery as well, excuse me, that when we, when we get sober or clean or ad address our addiction and let go of the grosser forms of addiction, that then we start to find more subtle forms of craving or aversion or addictiveness beneath the the grosser ones and so there's you know there's a he's kind of peeling the onion letting go of the layers um of of grasping of clinging uh of craving and and um and of suffering and you know and and as he's talking about you know with mindfulness it's the same thing and and this is exactly what the Anapanasati Sutta um, is is talking about in the in the four foundations of mindfulness. That we start with body, which is the grossest form of experience, the most solid form, and then we tune, we as the body becomes settled, we start to notice the more subtle experience of feeling, and then as feeling settles, we start to become aware of the even more subtle experience of consciousness itself, our awareness itself of mind. And then when that becomes deeply settled, we see the underlying patterns of reality, the, the impersonal, uh, you know, the characteristics of reality, of impermanence, of unsatisfactoriness, of not self. So this is this progression towards more and more subtle. So I have only gotten through... Um, the mindfulness part of this talk from Ajahn Viridamo. So I'm going to save the rest of it <laughs> uh, for next week. And I'm going to need to make a note for myself uh, to remember to start here. Uh, and uh, so um, I know I got a note from Steve saying he had to go. So some of you may have to, I see a few people have had to step out since, uh, you know, the hour has been consumed. Uh, but I will, I will stay on for a few minutes uh, to see if there are any comments or questions um, for people who can hang out. So thank you all. <laughs> Anybody? Anywhere? Anytime? Okay, then, if nobody, oh, there's a raised hand. It's Abigail. Hello, dear. Good morning. Please speak up. I mean, speak. I speak up. I just, I just <laughs> wanted to share an, an experience that I just had during this meditation. Um, and it kind of goes along with what you were talking about. Um, my mind was very distracted. Um, my iPad was, the fan is on and so I was thinking, should I stop? Should I turn it off? No, I can't leave and come back because Monica and Angela aren't here. And and then, oh, after this is over, I'll have to go. And then on my to-do list, I wasn't thinking about anything important at all, but it was just going the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then 
when it was time, I think the bell rang. I think it was at that point that I realized that my body was completely still. My body was doing just an incredible job meditating. <laughs> Mm. absolutely disconnected from what my mind was doing it was astounding yeah that's great so i mean i often find this as well and and that's a really good time to um tune into your body <laughs> and 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 enjoy it right it's like oh and that and that's it kind of gives me faith as well it's like oh even even when I don't feel like it's working, it's working. And, and, and that also, the other thing to enjoy about that, that happens because you have done a lot of practice. Because your body, your mind and body, your brain, and, and it knows how to get to this place. And it, it goes there because you've trained it to go there. Someone who's never meditated before probably would not have that ex same experience. But because you've got a lot of experience of practice, your you know your mind body state will go into that place if you just give it the time. Yeah, that's great, and just to, you know really appreciate that you know, and and right and, and so that when you're not feeling like when you're feeling as if nothing is happening, something is happening, and just hang out until the you know don't leave before the miracle as we say. You know, right? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Abigail. Uh, Tanya, hi. Hi, Kevin. Hi, everyone. I have probably an academic question. So I kind of loosely follow along in the book, and there was a word toward the beginning that I'm not familiar with. I think it's whinging. Whinging. Well, that's right. It's that the English term for whining or okay. complaining. Yeah. I thought that might be it. Thank yes. you. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I learned the meaning of that one the hard way. <laughs> when you're called a whinger, you're like, what? What am I? Yeah. Good one. And if you're called a wanker, then it's a whole other problem. But uh, keep that for the uh, you know, PG-13 version. All right, you guys. Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out. Hope you can come to some of the other events this week. And uh, if not, see you. See you next time. Bye. All right. Thanks, Ken. All right, Mike. Thank Steve. you. Thanks.